When traversing dark, dangerous swamps, it is common knowledge to never follow the lights. Some say they are evil spirits that died an agonizing death and now they seek to torment others in the same way. Others say they are tricksy face spirits who seek to direct you into a trap, while others claim they are servants of dark monsters like hags and evil wizards who use them to lure adventurers right into their grasp. Regardless of the truth, you never, ever follow the lights. Before we go deeper, let's go ahead and see first what the 5th edition monster manual says about the Will-O-Wisp. It says here that Will-O-Wisps look like bobbing lantern lights in the distance, though they can choose to alter their colors or wink out completely. Down here it continues saying that they lure unwary creatures into quicksand pits, monster lairs and other dangerous places so that they can feed on the suffering of their prey and revel in their death screams. Yikes. An evil being that falls prey to a Will-O-Wisp might become a Wisp itself its woeful spirit coalescing above its lifeless corpse like a flickering flame. It does continue here saying that if an evil being perishes in a land permeated with powerful magic, they can also turn into one of these monsters, which is interesting. They thrive in swampy bugs and bone-strewn battlements. Trapped in these desolate places of lost hope and memory, Will-O-Wisp lure other creatures towards dismal fates and feed on their misery. Down here he goes on to say that Will-O-Wisps sometimes make relationships with evil creatures. The Wisp draws the creatures to their deaths by the hands of monsters while the Wisp itself feeds on their misery. Now here we have the character sheet and the first thing we can notice is how difficult they are to hit. They have a 19 to their armor class which is wholly based on their outrageous dexterity. Make no mistake, Will-O-Wisps are really really fast. They're also immune to lightning and poison with a bunch of resistances to a lot of elements. They also resist non-magical weapons. Will-O-Wisps can speak, but they sound like faint, distant whispers. With this ability, they can basically finish off a dying character in order to regain hit points, which makes sense considering that they feed off the emotional traumas of dying people. They can move through objects as if they weren't there, and they can change the brightness of their colors. Their only form of attack here is a lightning shock, though they don't really explain to us how they can make this happen. Electricity just seems kinda random based on the info that we're given, like why is it electricity? And lastly, we're told they can magically turn invisible, though I should mention that their ability to turn invisible is actually not magical at all. You can't detect an invisible Will-O-Wisp with Detect Magic, for example, nor can you dispel its invisibility with a Dispel Magic spell. The Will-O-Wisp is simply naturally transparent, and when it turns off its light, it is basically invisible. But we'll talk more about that in just a moment. First, let's go ahead and talk about what the Monster Manual does not tell you about this creature. The first thing that I want to talk about is how different this monster sheet is from the previous editions. In the 5th edition monster manual, the Will-O-Wisp is only immune to poison and lightning, and the only reason that it is immune to even poison in here is because they consider the monster an undead. Though keep in mind that the Will-O-Wisp was actually never undead in any of the previous editions. This is actually new. The thing about D&D is that the world is fairly malleable. When you have gods that can turn you from one thing to another, when you have wizards able to cast wishes, when you have the power of magic at your command, things fluctuate a lot. The reality is there are actually different kinds of Will-O-Wisps. What you have here are the undead variety, the ones that spawn magically from evil souls that perish in agony, but they're also naturally born Will-O-Wisps. And then there's the Fey Will-O-Wisps, which are also very different. Most of them behave in basically the same way, but might have different properties here and there that differentiate them. This new variety of Will-O-Wisp is actually quite tame. Weak, actually. The real ones, the fey ones, the natural ones, those are actually completely immune to magic. This is from first edition. Quote, While any weapon will harm a will-o-wisp, most spells do not affect it. The only spells which can affect a creature are protection from evil, magic missile, and maze. End quote. That refers to the very high level maze spell, by the way. Now this is from 2nd edition, quote, Those attacking a Will-O-Wisp with any form of physical weapon are able to inflict damage normally. Persons making use of magical attacks, however, will find their powers almost ineffective against them. As a rule, the only spells which have any effect on the Will-O-Wisp are protection from evil, magic missiles, and maze, end quote. 
And this, by the way, just continues. This is third edition, and you can see here, it says pretty clearly on the stat sheet, immunity to magic. And then down here it says, quote, a will-o'-wisp is immune to most spells or spell-like abilities that allow spell resistance, except, once again, magic, missile, or maze, end quote. Both the Fey Will O Wisp and the Natural Will O Wisp have this perfect immunity to magic. The Undead one from 5th edition does not. Describing a Will O Wisp is difficult because they are there but also are not there. They are also different somewhat depending on the type that you're talking about, obviously. Sometimes they can tangibly affect you with shocks, but then they can also just go through objects as if they weren't even there. They are immune to magic, which is also interesting because it baffles the mind. How could a, a literal existing entity be simply just not affected by elements or magic of any kind? It's, it's most bizarre. An ancient elven manuscript described the Will-O-Wisp as, quote, a lattice of information with no material substance, a scroll with no parchment, much as is a symbol or a cleric's glyph of wording. It is crystalline energy, self-sustaining and potentially immortal, end quote. Now, this description describes perfectly the Fae style Will O Wisp. Now, like I said, there are three types of Will O Wisps. This is the type of Will O Wisp that I like to describe as a Fae Will O Wisp, and we'll talk about why just in a bit later. But basically, this Will O Wisp is just floating information, floating energy. What makes this particular Will O Wisp so interesting, though, is that it is the evolution of an already existing monster. A monster that you just don't get to see anymore. A monster that appears in first edition and then basically just disappeared from the face of D&D. That is the Bogart. A Bogart is a monster that has dozens and dozens of forms. Imagine li like a sort of shapeshifter except that it can't really control any shape for too long and as such it constantly shifts through forms and shapes. They are vulnerable to normal weapons but completely immune to any kind of magic except, as you can imagine, magic missiles and the maze spell. See, the face style Will-O-Wisp and the Bogart are actually one and the same. So now the reason why I call it the face style Will-O-Wisp is because Bogarts to me seem pretty fey. There's never explicitly described as being fey, it's just a name that I'm using for it to, to really set it apart from the others. In any case, to better explain how this all works, I will have to go through reproduction. Note once again that this is specifically for the face style Will-O-Wisp. The other wisps will work differently. Now, quote, there are three genders of Will-O-Wisp, to all intents and purposes identical in appearance, powers, and behavior. All are required for the production of the offspring. The reproductive act itself takes place usually deep within an impenetrable marsh necessary for the protection of the participants. The three Will-O-Wisp will draw close together and apparently merge their forms together, becoming one. The event is over in a moment. Almost immediately, the tripartite Will-O-Wisp flares to intolerable brightness, then splits once more into three. Left behind is an infant Bogart. If one wished to destroy a Will-O-Wisp, now would be the ideal time since the three parents are in a severely weakened state after the mating. Mating appears to take place in cycles. Adult Will-O-Wisps congregate rarely, but when they do, they tend to mate three or sometimes more times within a period of about a week. When the Bogarts are born, the parents share the nursing chores. After the Bogarts are capable of hunting, the parents leave them to fend for themselves. The Bogarts, however, tend to stay together. I know not whether for social reasons or simply because three can hunt more efficiently than one until they reach maturity." End quote. The Bogart, once it is born, it is born in the form of a rough humanoid, but without any distinguishing features, no telling gender or any form of descriptor, really just a, a rough shape of a humanoid. It'll grow rapidly to the point that within two weeks it is the size of a two-year-old human. During all this time, the Will-O-Wisp will feed the baby Bogart energy as nursing. Once it reaches two years of age, the Bogart will develop electrical powers that will allow it to hunt, at which point the Will-O-Wisp will abandon it in order for it to fend for itself. So, for those first two years of life, the Bogart will look like an odd, just nondescript humanoid, but then, at the two-year mark, once it is left for its own to hunt, it'll start to randomly, without any input and without any volition or warning, start to transform into a wisp. Though only momentarily, it'll turn into a wisp and then back to its normal shape. This 
is the spark that starts its maturity. After a bit, it'll go back to being a Bogart, but instead of turning back into a rough, nondescript humanoid shape, it'll come back as a shape of an individual that it has seen or met. And this will keep on happening over and over again. Every time this cycle happens, the Bogart will get bigger and bigger, or rather the transformation makes him bigger and bigger. Then, at the age of 5, the Bogart will make its final transition to an adult Will-O-Wisp form, where in a big flash of burning light, it'll transform into an adult Will-O-Wisp permanently. Quote, when the Bogart shifts from corporeal form to non-corporeal form, like for example from humanoid form to Will-O-Wisp form, the body of the creature literally disintegrates. The position of every atom in that body is remembered by the non-corporeal creature. The matter that actually made up the body is converted into energy. Some of this tremendous energy yield is consumed fueling the non-corporeal being of the creature. The vast majority is channeled off to the negative energy plane. It is this close connection with the negative material plane that grants the Will-O-Wisp immunity to most magical spells. Only those that disturb the actual non-material lattice of the Will-O-Wisp's existence can damage it. When the reverse change occurs, the body is rebuilt following the template in the mind of the Bogart. The actual matter required for the body is recreated using energy withdrawn from the negative material plane." End quote. Though keep in mind that once the Bogart makes the final adult transition, it is final and it'll never have a Bogart shape again. From that point on, all you would see is a Will-O-Wisp. So there, that's what I call the face style Will-O-Wisp. But then we have what I call the natural Will-O-Wisps, which are formed by well, nature itself and are for the most part not really magical at all. This is how these ones look without the light, sometimes similar to a kind of spore. Quote, a Will-O-Wisp body is not a single solid mast, but rather a cluster of 12 to 15 gas-filled nodes stuck together in a spherical shape by a transparent, spongy substance. These clear nodes are covered with porous membranes that pulse as the wisp breathes." End quote. Keep in mind that it looks like it has a color here, but they're supposed to be transparent. They are basically invisible naturally. Now, these Will-O-Wisps feed off of both natural gas and emotional energy, but before I go any further, I should mention how generally Will-O-Wisps feed, because we haven't really touched on that. On the 5th edition Monster Manual, we were told that they feed on fear and despair, and that they drink the agony of a last breath and savor the sensation of life going out in creatures' eyes. It sounds pretty macabre, but it is literally how they feed. But on less fantasy terms, Will-O-Wisps feed on the fury of electrical activity given off by the brains of panic-stricken individuals as they realize that death is inescapable. And this is why they like to bring adventurers right into traps like quicksands, because they are slow and it prolongs the suffering of the victim, which gives us more food for the wisp. This is why many will-o'-wisps actually live in graveyards. They simply go invisible and subtly feed off of the anguish and mourning of those that visit the place. Now, in the second edition Monster Manual, they wrote, quote, It seems certain that the unusual environment found in bugs and swamps is important to the creature's existence in some way, but the exact nature of this link is uncertain. It seems probable that the ominous and haunting nature of these places increases the fear and dread which their victims feel and thus the energy which they give off prior to death." End quote. The reality is that will o -Wisps actually also feed off of the putrid gases that are found on the swamp, or at least the ones I call the natural will o -Wisps do. It's hard to tell exactly how much of this actually carries over to all Will-O-Wisps, but I will carry on. Quote, a wisp inhales the gas formed by decomposing plant and animal matter and processes it in several ways. It expels some of the gas to propel itself through the air with great precision and speed while absorbing the rest of the gas to fuel its biological functions. Digesting gas in this way produces a byproduct that ignites a heatless light when it comes into contact with air. When a will-o'-wisp exhales, this byproduct flares up on the surface of its skin, creating its flickering flames and the faintest smell of sulfur. 
The WISP's alien digestion process also results in an internal buildup of electricity which the Will-O-Wisp uses as an attack form." End quote. This explains everything from why a Will-O-Wisp uses electricity to attack, to how can it float and produce light, to why it needs to feed off of the electricity in people's brains, to why it lives in the swamp. Now, this particular type of wisp has these membranes called nodal membranes, and those contain tiny multipurpose sensory organs which the wisp can use to see and hear. These nodes are created at a rate of once a month, and they are produced at the core, and they will push the other nodes outward. The exposed nodes will age and tear quickly. Eventually, they will deflate and fall off the creature at also at a rate of once a month. If the wisp is overall healthy and feeds daily for at least half a year, it'll then grow three extra nodes on the outside of its body, which will then break off together and form a completely new willow wisp, which is how these ones reproduce. The new wisp will develop more nodes over the next two weeks until it matures into an adult-sized wisp. In this form, there is actually no limit to how many times this wisp can reproduce in this way, though we cannot control the process at all. It is really just a matter of how much food there is in the environment and whether or not the swamp can support more wisp. If the wisp is feeding properly, then it just reproduces. Now, what's interesting is that for this natural will-o'-wisp, each single node is actually almost its own entity. Each node can think for itself, although they die if separated from the main core. A wisp can actually think with all of these minds at once and together, and this gives this type of wisp an advanced intelligence which allows it to perform cunning tricks and plans in order to trick adventurers into traps. Further, since the original nodes of a newborn wisp came from the parent, the baby will have all of the memories, thoughts, and personalities as the progenitor, which means all will-o'-wisps from the same area are basically the same. They all have the same memories and think of themselves as a single creature. This is why will-o'-wisps from the same area tend to work together, because they see themselves as basically the same creature. However, serious rivalries can occur if will-o'-wisps from different areas come into the territory, and fighting between between wisps can occur in those circumstances. It is not unlikely to see wisps of different colors, representing different strains, fighting one another. Now, these natural wisps do need to eat or they break down and die, and they need both natural gases and negative emotions to eat and thrive. If they have no trauma to feed off of, they can only survive for up to three months on those gases alone. But if they have no natural decomposing gases, but all the trauma that they could ever want, they would die in about a week. The gases are more important than trauma, it seems. A single wisp requires at least one mile of swamp to sustain itself. The graveyard of a small town is also enough to sustain a single wisp, with the fumes and the gases of the decomposing bodies helping it. Lastly, these will-o'-wisps also need to sleep at least for a few hours a day. These are the ones that you will find coming out of hollow trees or from caves when you pass by. So as you can see, there are tons of differences between all of the different kinds of will-o'-wisps. The Bogart variation are magical and spectacular with transformations and fae like wonder. They are literally just bubbles of information, completely immaterial, literal entities made out of light. And then there is the more natural wisps who have really no magic to them. They, they work as a natural biofungi thing with bioprocesses that are very well explained. And then there's the undead version of the 5th edition monster manual which are more like souls of the departed that are stuck in the world cursed. At the end of the day, what we do know that is shared among all of them is that they do feed off of agony and terror. We know that they can turn invisible if they wish it, and we know that they communicate with each other through a form of Morse code by blinking in and out with their light, and then they can communicate with adventurers through dark whispers and ominous telepathy. We know that you should never follow them because they are universally bad for your health. If you're ever in doubt about which one you're fighting, I would recommend just casting magic missiles. That has never failed anyone before. 
I would like to personally thank my patron supporters, Sack Bowel, Rogato Fan, Barry Maskant, 5e Magic Shop, Daniel Umar, Morgan Johnson, Rusty Rain, Biotechnofrag, Daniel Luna, Doc Feeder, Brad Salazar, Terry Culp, The Great Codini, Walker Modley, Omega Scales, Karathas the Bulwark, Ziran King, Ozol, Ariel Nelson, Alex Cookson, Griffin Pierce, Falky951, Benjamin Bosters, Mr. Salty, Thomas Hunt, Drayden, Tesla Coil, The Role Playing Junkies Podcast, Silent Choppa, Prince Daylight Morning Crown, Jericho Darkstars, Sabine Kurshop, Troll Skull Dude, Solarensis, Ordoric, William Slatten, Nathan McComb, Bushido Burrito, AG Dare Music, Soulless Rider, Roleplay with Advantage, Tum, Blake Ash, Stalia, Items to Astound on DM's Guild, Samuel King, Lost Crusader, and Sean Duthat for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash Rex to support. Alright guys, thank you so much for watching and thank all of you who voted for this particular topic, the, the Will-O-Wisp, on Patreon at the $10 and $25 level. I appreciate that. I'm gonna be using the same poll to uh, figure out the next monster because the next monster Monster was basically tied with the Willow Wisp, so I'll be using that for the next one. But then after that video, I'll make another poll so that you guys can decide what's gonna be next after that. But, anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for being here. Thank you for liking and commenting. And I'll see you all next time. Bye bye.